All right, welcome to another Book of the Day show today. I've got an awesome guest, Jim Davies, author of one of my favorite books, Riveted, The Science of Why Jokes Make Us Laugh, Movies Make Us Cry, and Religion Makes Us Feel One with the Universe. You know, one of the things that uh, I've found as an investor, an entrepreneur, uh, to be almost the limiting factor for everybody trying to do big things is can you attract attention and keep attention? Because, you know, there's that old saying, you know, if a tree falls in the woods uh, and no one's there, does it make a noise? And I always say the answer is who cares, right? If there's no one paying attention to what you're doing, uh, it doesn't matter how great your idea or how great your intentions are. So, Jim, thanks for being uh, taking some time for us today. My pleasure. So I always like it these just to kind of jump in to I always start with dessert here. So my I don't know if it's my favorite part of the book, but um, something that I found fascinating, and and I once read this somewhere else, but you talk about uh, psychologist Hank Davis and Lindsay McLeod conducted a large study at, that asked people to sort news stories published between 1700 and 2001 into classifications. Mm. And the 12, the 12 categories that emerged corresponded to the things we have evolved to find important. So it was, you list a few of them, issue, uh, articles about reputation, treatment of offspring, good deeds, violence, sexual assault. Uh, and so if you look at TV, if you turn on the TV or turn on TMZ or sit at the counter and see the, the latest tabloid, it's always about these things. Can you talk a little bit about these 12 things and, and why we're so attracted to them and, and maybe how people can use them for good if you're doing marketing and, and trying to keep people's attention focused on whatever it is you're, uh, you know, you're talking about? Sure, sure. Well, uh, one of the things that I hope people get out of the book is um, that the things that just feel really natural to us about what we're interested in are actually based on very ancient things that we evolved to pay attention to. So if you think of a bunch of uh, human beings and you know, living in a group of 150 people, what kind of things would the people there need to pay attention to to be able to thrive and survive and have offspring and get along and blah, blah, blah? Uh, and, of course, the people who pay attention to the right things are going to out-survive the ones who don't. You know? uh, and so since we spend about the um, vast majority of our evolutionary history in such um, places and a lot of the technological stuff that we're enjoying today is so new that evolution hasn't really had a chance to um, adapt to it very well. Uh, we end up paying attention to all of those things that you know our Paleolithic ancestors would have thought was important. Uh, so things like who's fighting with whom and who's having sex with whom and uh, uh, issues of um, reputation and who to trust, and all these kind of things are extraordinarily important if you're living in a group of 150 people. Um, and, and what's interesting is that now, you know, our news stories and what we find, you know, gossip-worthy and those kind of things also correspond to this kind of stuff. But our minds haven't really caught up to the fact that the news story might be talking about somebody on another continent. And, and most of your mind doesn't realize that this is completely irrelevant to your life. You know what I mean? So, you know, we want to hear, oh, my God, look what he did to his wife. That's so terrible. And, oh, my goodness, we spend all this time, you know, thinking about it, talking about it, spending money on news to hear about it for something that's basically irrelevant to our lives. But, you know, our minds don't really understand uh, that, uh, you know, we're hearing about people that aren't relevant to us. So maybe one way to say is, you know, what you're talking about in the book, Riveted, is that if you're not careful in the modern world, you'll be hijacked. You've got these kind of like sugar. You know, we've all uh, survived. Our great, 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 great grandparents survived because they were good at finding sugar, which is a quick source of energy if you're, you know, hungry. But now we live in a world where every convenience store, you're bombarded by excess uh, sugar at every instance. And in the same way, when you see somebody talking about, you know, Kim Kardashian or Kanye West or Bill Clinton's affair, it's like we are attuned to that even though in the long run it probably is irrelevant for the quality of our own life. Yeah, and, and you know, another interesting thing is uh, look at, looking at education. Look at, uh, you know, a bunch of third graders, okay? 
you have to fight to get them in the seat to learn math. What do they want to do? They want to socialize. They want to play with each other, and they want to build relationships with the other people around them. And if you think about growing up in a tribe of 150 people, those relationships are absolutely key to your survival. So what school is trying to do is try, it's trying to get people to learn things that they are evolved to not care about, right? They're, they're there to they, – their minds, their, of their genes are saying, you've got to build social relationships. You've got to play with people. You've got to understand how the social world works. And meanwhile, the teachers are like, no, no, you've got to learn how to add. You have to learn how to, you know, do this and that. And that's part of why it's a struggle to get um, students to pay attention to these kind of esoteric concepts. So do you think, just kind of going with that, is there – a place for schools adjusting and going, listen, let's have some time where you can socialize and it's a little structured. You learn how to socialize. It's like Dale Carnegie's famous book, uh, Warren Buffett says it's the most important thing he ever learned in life, how to win friends and influence people. So maybe schools should be teaching social skills, not just social studies. Well, you know, it, I think that what's interesting is that in today's society, it actually is important to learn some of this stuff that is evolutionarily not interesting. It is important to learn how to write. It is important to learn how to do math, even though that's stuff we didn't evolve with. I think that what maybe, uh, you know, and this isn't really my field, but I think that one thing that would be really good to think about would be how do we frame these important but essentially uninteresting topics in the context of things that we naturally find interesting? Can we get... Can we make math? Can we turn it into a social game? Can we, you know, use ideas of what things naturally make us riveted to make education more interesting? That might be an interesting area to pursue. Yeah. You talk about something interesting. You said we find disturbing images compelling since they yeah. tend to hit at, hit at dangerous important information. Even if we're horrified, we can't look away like drivers on right. the highway who have to slow down. And you see that, you know, horror movies are one of those movies that, Paranormal activity. Somebody spent fifteen thousand dollars creating that movie, and it made over a hundred million dollars because we just can't turn away from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which may, uh, and, may or may not be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's uh, you know, I lived in Atlanta for ten years, and I'm sure you have the same experience in L.A. Every morning, you know, you could hear the traffic report, and there's an accident on the I-85, you know, going south. But then there's always a traffic jam going north because of all the rubberneckers. It's like the, the desire to look at an accident was so great that there were traffic jams in both directions, even in the direction where there wasn't an accident, you know. Um, but we're interested, you know, we need, you, you know, we, we have to know what, we have to hear what's dangerous about the world. You know, if somebody comes to your, your you know, your group and says, hey, don't go over that mountain. There are, there's a very hostile group of people or, you know, there's dangerous, the food is poisonous. You damn well better listen to that stuff because you're going to, you know, if you have to learn that through trial and error, you're toast. So nowadays we have this real attunement to negative information, which partially explains why uh, the news is so overwhelmingly negative is that we, you know, we, we, it's like candy for our minds. Yeah. I always say the biggest drug dealer is not on the street selling crack. It's the drug dealer in our own brain manipulating us sometimes for our own good and sometimes for the good of a world that no longer exists, you know? I think, yeah, I think that is a great way to think about it. Another way I like to, I, one thing I hope that people get out of Riveted is it helps them build a psychological immune system, like a way to, you know, if you understand, huh. oh, I'm going to get, I know I'm going to, oh, maybe I'm just paying attention to this because it's negative, maybe, but I have to like, think more carefully, is this actually relevant to my life? Is this something I should be putting resources into? Um, because if you just trust your gut, you're going to pay attention to things that are ultimately unimportant. So I, ho I was hoping with the book that by understanding the very basic fundamental, you know, psychological aspects that make you interested in things, you can be more choosy and more uh, reflective about what kinds of content you take in in your life. Now, jumping from one interesting thing to even more controversy, I'm never one to shy away. You say, and I'm, I, I've got the book on my iBooks. I got this physical book and I usually down, I usually buy a book physically so I have yours. I took notes in the margins and then I also have downloaded on my iPhone. So on page 38 on the iPhone let's talk about religion. You say there's abundant evidence that good or bad religion is compelling and this book is all about what compels us. And you right. say and it's not just that any strange belief 
will catch on. There's a limited catalog of possible religious beliefs. Let's talk religion. Uh, you put in things like I will show how certain mental disorders correlate with religion, mania, obsessive, compulsive. Obviously, you're not saying that everybody who's religious has those things, but there, uh, there is even a genetic component. You said the famous Minnesota twin study found that 47% or more of religiosity is genetic. So let's, let's, right. let's uh, jump right into the, the flames here. Yeah. Uh, well, you said a lot of things right there. So um, let me see. The first, like, uh, right, so the possible, you can think of, you ever heard of a design space? You're familiar with that idea? Um, like yeah. the design space of chairs, you know, you can, you can go so far before it's not a chair anymore, right? So when you look at a chair catalog, you're looking like you're sort of exploring the design space of chairs. And certain chairs are just not going to work. They're not going to be interesting looking. They're not going to, you're not going to be able to sit on them or whatever. They're outside the design space. And religion is kind of like that. And a lot of people don't know, most people's familiarity with religion is limited to, you know, Christianity, the Christianity uh, Islam, uh, Judaism, and maybe they know something about Hinduism or whatever, but the vast majority of religions are, you know, very quite different from those, but um, it's easy to get this idea that, oh, people could believe in anything, you know, but it's not true. When you start looking across religions, you find a lot of similarities uh, about what kinds of religious ideas are even plausible, right? Um, one of the examples I really like is, uh, you know, this idea of like a bleeding statue, right? So you might hear, oh, there was a a statue that'll bleed when you pray or something like that, right? Now, I don't, you know, I'm not particularly religious, um, but even atheists can see that that is kind of a reasonable religious belief, as opposed to something like a statue that can bleed and can talk and can turn into a person and can fly away. Uh, you know, as it gets more complicated, it gets kind of comical. That even right. an atheist can tell that that does, that that's you know that's that's silly. I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't believe in the bleeding statue, but I don't think it's necessarily silly. But you know, once you start adding on all these things, it just starts sounding kind of ridiculous. Right. That was one of the cool things I discovered in researching this book is that you know the, the religions for them to catch on. If you think of you know religions as existing in a, a marketplace of ideas, uh, you know certain religions are going to make it, and certain ones are not, and. Uh, I hope that I hope that I described in my book, you know, the characteristics that made you know religions catch on. How about religion being somewhat genetic? Your propensity to be super religious. Yeah, th th you know, this is. Um, I don't think a lot of people believe that their religiosity, as we call it, how religious you are, is a personal choice. Um, but I think a lot of people attribute it to their upbringing. You know. Uh, but really, you know, your sense of how you feel about the nature of coincidence, for example, uh, that's genetic, right? It's you, you, nobody raised you to be skeptical of coincidence or to accept coincidence or anything like that. It's just, you know, just people have different thresholds, uh, or they feel connected with other people in the universe. These aren't things that you can train in somebody. They're not things that you can, well, you can train them a little bit, but when you start thinking of them in that sense, it's not so... Uh, hard to believe because those, right. are the, those are the personality traits that are precursors to somebody being a religious kind of person. I mean, I don't believe in God, and I know a lot of people believe in God, and they just feel that God exists, and I just don't feel that God exists. And, 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 and for the most part, it's as simple as that. For most people, if it just feels like that there's, there are supernatural entities out there, they're going to believe in them, and if they don't, then they don't. And it just, and it just so happens that the study showed that, you know, that, you know the variance – uh, is you know uh, largely determined by genetics. Fascinating. Now, for somebody listening, uh, you know one of the most common things I think that uh, I read an interesting survey of young uh, of of the kind of cross sectional of different ages, but younger people in particular. They said, "What's important to you now?" And in the modern world right now, it's never been a time where more people are interested in being famous. They did a study, you know, in the 40s, so I can't remember the number, you know, 5% of people, of kids in high school want to be famous. Now it's something like 50%. So uh, whether it's wanting to be famous or you have a job, you're in sales, and you want to be able to keep people's attention, people don't blow you off, uh, or you're a public speaker, or you're doing marketing, you know, do you think some people 
are just naturally more compelling. I think that's kind of obvious, but do you see a way in your book where you talk about how somebody who's not been particularly a great public speaker, not been particularly good at marketing their ideas, can can use what you talk about in the book and really, you know, all of a sudden turn it around and become infinitely more interesting? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, and, um, and I've been asked this several times, and if I were to rewrite the book, I might spend a little bit more time about how a, a, a person can be more compelling. Um, the book is mostly about products of people, you know, books, movies, media, inventions, religions, things that people create, are those compelling or not? But of course, person can be compelling. You know, you might see a compelling speaker or just somebody, some people when they just walk in the room, they just have this presence and everyone just sort of looks like, oh, who's that? Like, it's a real somebody, you know, it's that, um, uh, my friend put it, what, like the, the lead singer, right? Like some people have a great voice, but they just don't have that lead singer presence, you know? Um, and so the book is more about the kind of things you can talk about and this kind of thing, but it, I think that if somebody wanted to be good at, say, pitching a business to venture capitalists uh, or they wanted to become a better public speaker, uh, I think that, that, you know, my book's probably not the best book for that, but they should probably – really practice. I think practice is really essential for getting better. I mean, people have natural talent, but, you know, you, got, you, you can't change that. You just, all you can work with is practice. So, like, practicing public speaking and getting a community of very critical people <laughs> to hone you and make it better and better so that, you know, you, you, you come off the way you want to, I think it's uh, really important. You know, Although, actually, you know. Interesting, interestingly, I think Al Gore, one of the reasons that his um, – what's it called, his, his, his running for president was uh, not good is that he, he sounded too practiced. Like, a, a, you know, an interviewer would ask him a question and he would, you know, they'd say, oh, he sounds like he's just, he's, you know, he's, he's just like rattling it off. But, if, you know, of course he's heard that question a hundred times, right? So in that, in that case, he, he, he failed to make it sound fresh, you know, and people got a little bit turned off by that, I think. <laughs> 